Hello, hello. This is Daniel Kirsch, and today we're going to talk about the presidency and the Constitution. Um, I want to keep this very simple, but uh, just to begin, your textbook authors, Laurie Cox, Hahn, and Diane Heath, are actually very comprehensive when it comes to the constitutional history uh, behind the thought in the presidency, and I don't want to recap a lot of that here. Uh, but they talk quite a bit about it's the origins of constitutional thought in Greco-Roman political thought, uh, need, need to balance a temporary uh, executive role with a sense of proportionality, uh, and a sense of not wanting to allow for a permanent dictatorship. Um, let's see. So how does this relate to the American presidency? Well, the presidency was created in, in the context of having a, a Confederacy Congress um, that simply was ineffective at being able to save um, people's lives and liberty and and the pursuit of their property, which was, you know, the words uh, at first of philosopher John Locke uh, in, in Great Britain, partially in reaction to, you know, all, all the turmoil in, in England in the 17th century. Um, but it was really poor. The American presidency and, and the Confederal Congress actually was really poor at creating a Republican space um, you know, save for the periodic meetings of the Continental Congress. Uh, there was really no framework uh, for, you know, ties between any of the existing states. Jefferson was a thinker who was severely influenced by Locke, uh, but he was not someone who was present at the creation of the Constitution. He was, um, even though he had drafted the Declaration of Independence and um, had been governor of Virginia and was an ambassador to France at this point, uh, and, he, he was involved, or at least in conversation, but during the creation of the new constitution, some of his followers and, and some people thought um, he, he was certainly involved in it, but he wasn't, at least not directly. You know, he wasn't there and didn't have the internet, you know, and didn't have phones. So um, correspondence took quite a long time between the two continents and, and there simply was not enough time for him to be involved. So even though we have this ideal of life and liberty and property in the Declaration of Independence in 1776, it's not explicitly mentioned in the Constitution itself, uh, which was drafted in 1787. Um, well, we see, we more see that come later with the Bill of Rights, um, with a follower, written primarily by a follower or at least ally of Jefferson, James Madison. Uh, and that was passed about two years after, well, yeah, two years after the Constitution was was uh, ratified. Uh, one of the things that has to be that that guarded against this kind of um, you know um, let me let me start again. Uh, one of the things they tried to guard against was this kind of co-opted executive that a lot of Republicans and Democrats, and I don't mean the modern day term. I mean use the term loosely of Republicans and Democrats. Uh, they had really been afraid of seeing that they, they would see a return to monarchy. Uh, so they, a lot of them wanted to have a committee of an executive and a presiding officer of the Continental Congress during this period uh, of Continental Congresses in the 1770s and 80s. Uh, but mostly they saw a need to create an office that was a countervailing force to Congress, which itself they were afraid of growing as, a power, as powerful as a parliament um, was in Great Britain. And despite all their protestations, the king himself was somehow responsible for their plight in the Declaration of Independence. That was sort of a decision that Jefferson made in writing it. Jefferson and, and Adams, of course, too. Uh, so they were afraid of a powerful parliament uh, that would try to abolish their liberties and raise their taxes in the very agrarian United States. Uh, so they attempted to create this presidency as a way to check the power of Congress. And they needed a judiciary to actually check the power of the presidency and guarantee that these branches would be co-equal and neither one would dominate the other. So during the debate in the Continental Congress between all the 55 delegates who were in Philadelphia that hot summer, um, Alexander Hamilton made a speech in June that's recounted in the unofficial notes uh, of James Madison uh, in this speech that, that Hamilton made in June. I believe it was uh, the 18th or 17th. I could be wrong on the exact date. But Hamilton laid out a vision for a lifetime elected president, a uh, lifetime president elected by the Senate who had an absolute veto, but who was not hereditary. So has limits. 
But Hamilton didn't see the problem with having a monarch, you know, who was uh, however you come into the office or someone who's trusted as a countervailing weight to this kind of democratic mob. If you're only going to be voting twice, really, for most things, every two years, you're going to be voting for the state legislature, which is usually annual, maybe biannual. But then you're also voting for Congress because the state legislatures themselves elect senators. Um, and those legislat legislatures are the ones who choose electors. Uh, and those electors would choose who would choose the electoral college are the people who would be kind of learned people of society who are not tied to politics and they get to choose uh, whoever uh, the new the new president should be. Hamilton conceded that um, a lot, you know, we had to be advocate. Sorry, uh, he conceded that a lot had to be uh, entrusted to the to the new executive. Um, but it could have been worse. You know, Hamilton, he did want an absolute veto, he, but he did get a veto that could be overridden by Congress with a two-thirds majority. He wanted a lifetime president. We got a four-year president. Uh, he wanted, uh, yeah, he, he wanted a president elected by the Senate. Uh, he got a president elected by the Electoral College, which is, you know, just as good. Uh, so what was the difference? Uh, they just didn't want someone who was as equally kind of controlled or dominated by these kind of democratic notions as the House of Representatives, the Congress would be. Um, so electors were initially supposed to be just disinterested, dispassionate people who would choose someone like George Washington, who literally presided uh, with very little debate and input over the Constitutional Convention. So, you know, he was a respected figure. Uh, he had been a leader in the military forces uh, in the war that had commanded many of the men that ended up going to the convention. So when they were talking about the president, they pretty much already knew who their prime candidate would be. It was just a matter of, you know, what they were going to be entrusting him with. And one of those things they wanted to entrust him with, they didn't think was very controversial, is that, that uh, Congress would have the power to declare war uh, in Congress. Like Parliament, they would have the power to declare war that ultimately is a very effective tool because the Congress is the one who gets to vote for the funds. So in effect, even today, Congress really must be consulted in terms of military conflict. However, they did not live in a kind of hyper-industrial, hyper-technological society as we do today. And at that time, to basically deliberate over a war is something that they considered very serious, and rightly so. But today uh, would be considered kind of a luxury because wars tend to happen very quickly, and the run-up to it, if there's any debate that has to happen before any sort of strike occurs, that can happen in an instant, can happen on a massive scale. So there's often a cloud of danger overhanging any sort of debate about an impending war and whether Congress can actually have an effective check on the presidency in terms of who can declare it and who can commit troops. One way that Congress has tried to solve this issue is a direct response to something that Nixon had done. Which, of course, as I mentioned in some of my other lectures, that he bombed Cambodia. Uh, and so they thought, well, instead of allowing a president to just take over foreign policy, why don't we just say that in a crisis, a president commit troops for up to 90 days? And then if the president doesn't secure funding from Congress for an additional 90 days or an extended long period of time, then the president has to then withdraw those troops. It was passed over Nixon's veto, uh, but no president has ever recognized it as a legitimate constraint on executive power, even though it was passed by Congress lawfully, uh, you know, with a with a veto override, but it, you know, it was a resolution. Um, um, let's see. So even though I've, I've observed, you know, members of Congress attempting to sue a president civilly for violations of the War Powers Act, it's never ended up working. Uh, another power that the president has is the um, pardon power. And I put up here a couple of highlights of the pardon power, you know, the Ford pardon Nixon in an attempt to heal the country. Uh, Obama, you know, as your book said, a detailed, um, let's see, excuse me. So Ford pardoned Nixon in an attempt to heal the country, uh, and Obama, as your book said, uh, issued in the last days of his administration nearly 2,000 combined orders um, of clemency commutation. Um, yeah, and, and so the pardon... Is, is meant to address some injustices, not really inequities, but injustices perhaps that the Justice Department perceived in the waning days uh, of, of Obama's administration. Um, but it's really up to you whether you think that fulfills Hamilton's original argument in Federalist 74 about why the executive should have the power, this power that's relatively unchecked, uh, this power to pardon people. 
And that is simply that it can be used as a last-ditch tool to kind of de-escalate tensions when they occur because um, those tensions can, can form uh, on either a military or financial or economic basis, but they can also be uh, just just based in political calculus and they can always be solved with a government institution. So what I'm trying to say here, not well, is that uh, every president makes a calculus about what they would like to do ideally in pardoning their allies and often their political allies, but in the case of um, President Obama, he opted to grant clemency to a lot of uh, people who were not his allies, but who, but people who were simply people who were were certainly admired by many of his constituents. People like um, Chelsea Manning, who had who had divulged um, a lot of secret, military secrets uh, to to WikiLeaks. Uh, and if you don't know what that is, we can talk about it later. Um, but besides that, uh, President Trump had ended up pardoning a lot of his real personal and political allies and, and large donors. Uh, but President Clinton had done something like that as well. Uh, he had pardoned Mark Rich, but, um, but uh, President Trump pardoned a lot more people than that uh, who were his allies, and, and uh, they made the Rich pardon seem kind of quaint by comparison uh, by most observations. Anyway, some of the other powers that a president has that are, of course, spelled out in Article 2 of the Constitution are this uh, appointment power, uh, the appointment power of both the judiciary and the cabinet, and one appointment power um, that you should recognize is that a president must be able to appoint cabinet members, uh, the, the heads of the, of the administration departments. But then an additional 1,200 executive branch employees that need to be confirmed by the Senate un under their constitutional advice and consent authority. Uh, and this goes to federal judges as well that are appointed for life. But one wrinkle uh, about that is that there's a case that's referred to in your textbook in the 1920s. I believe it's Myers versus U.S., where, you know, the, the Supreme Court found the president does not need the advice and consent of the Senate to fire or remove any of those 1,200 people or cabinet secretaries. So you should know that the closest the presidency came to being successfully changed by an impeachment trial is when Andrew Johnson was the president in the, in the aftermath of the Civil War. Uh, he had succeeded Abraham Lincoln. Uh, this is way before the 25th Amendment. Uh, but in 1868, he had appointed, um, well, he had fired uh, the Secretary of War. I'm forgetting who this was right now, probably Edwin Stanton. Um, but he had fired the Secretary of War, and Congress had voted to impeach him for violation of the Tenure of Office Act, something they had recently passed, uh, which prevented presidents from firing people without the consent of Congress. And so when he fired someone, uh, then he appointed the acting Secretary of War uh, to be Ulysses S. Grant, uh, the Civil War general, Republican, and later his successor, uh, who would later, and two years later. There was this comical reading of a cabinet meeting where no one would recognize Grant, uh, or no, and Grant didn't want to be recognized, and no one recognized Johnson as having called on Grant because Grant wasn't supposed to be there, but he was. Um, and they knew that the game was afoot with impeachment, um, and Johnson got very upset. Uh, you know, he was a whiskey drinker. Um, he probably drank a lot of whiskey that day during that cabinet meeting. Um, but I think what you should know is they impeached him for violation of this act that 60 years later the Supreme Court found to be an unconstitutional act, uh, unconstitutional law. So really, Johnson was just impeached for political purposes by a party that didn't like him. And ultimately, you know, he was not removed because uh, in the reading of John F. Kennedy's book, Profiles and Courage, that you may or may not have, that may or may not have been co-written by uh, or ghostwritten by his close associate, either Ted Sorensen or Pierre Salinger, not quite sure. Uh, the appointment power is one that only goes one way. So you can, uh, the advice and consent power rather, is one that only goes one way. You don't have, need the advice and consent of the Senate to fire anyone. Um, so I get that question sometimes. It does have historical baggage, so you should probably know about it. Then there's another one, executive privilege. Uh, this is something that Nixon started to really use a lot, especially in the Watergate scandal. Uh, and, and I believe I mentioned it before, but executive privilege is just this idea that anything that a president talks about can be protected by either claiming national security privilege or just executive privilege. And every president has really claimed executive privilege in some context uh, legally since Nixon. Uh, 
So apparently the courts do recognize it as an existing phenomenon, but it's unclear what the extent of it is. And various presidents have always tried to encroach upon the ability of Congress to oversee the executive branch by claiming increasing areas of communication has pr been protected by executive privilege. So to be clear, privilege doesn't mean you can't see it and the public can't see it. Um, the me means you, yeah, privilege means you can't see it and the public can't see it. It's sort of like doctor-patient privilege, but for leaders of government. Uh, and executive orders are, are another idea. And I like the anecdote that the book authors open the chapter with, which is um, Obama had counseled incoming President Donald Trump in 2016 personally that if you want to do anything, you should probably go through Congress because if nothing else, it's harder to change when the next person comes in. Trump did not follow that advice and issued a lot of executive orders in his first two weeks as president. So did Joe Biden. Um, uh, I, I don't know how many executive orders he, he issued in his first 100 days, but there were quite a few. Um, and a lot of them were just repeals of Trump-era executive orders. Um, but they do have limited legal authority. They're just directives of how the executive branch will carry out the laws that are already written. So it's not like writing a new law, and they're not, they're not creating new funding. They're just interpreting the law in a way that will make them uh, pursue certain cases or certain projects within the federal government that affect people. Um, and finally, the Supreme Court is, as I said, you know, as, Am as Hamilton has argued, um, and he did argue, that it was a necessary check. It was the only way to guarantee that one of the two branches would not kind of contravene the other. So these are the various powers of the presidency, and those are the kind of roots uh, that the executive branch has in, in philosophy and republicanism and liberalism. I want to be clear that the executive was really desirable in neither republicanism or liberalism. It was just seen as a necessary administrative role that wasn't necessarily welcome in either framework um, because of the history of the monarchy. But both of them had, always, had actually discouraged Americans from thinking that there should be one overarching monarch that they should be loyal to. And so in both cases of you know, republicanism and liberalism, whether it was uh, this tradition of, of kind of political philosophy dating back to the Roman era uh, of republicanism uh, or this new philosophy that was sort of in, in opposition to monarchy that was based more in kind of um, the British middle class um, uprising that, that ultimately beheaded their king in the 1640s. Um, in both of those cases, uh, uh, English people and Americans particularly were very allergic to the idea of a new executive. Uh, and that's why Hamilton's thinking was so controversial at the time. But as I've said before, he kind of drafted his own constitution in a way that would have allowed him to be prime minister to King George Washington. And so this didn't quite work out the way he wanted, but he got a lot of what he wanted throughout history. And of course, one more thing that I'll point you towards is the limits of constitutional power for presidents that have been uh, met in the Supreme Court with op opposition. And then there, they've, you know, it's... They, they sometimes tend to side with the president in terms of military deference, but not always. And so they can't always be counted on as an ally. One thing that's not in your book is apparently the Supreme Court did not allow former President Trump to keep his tax returns private from a prosecutor in New York City. Um, so that's one of the most recent, I guess, intersections of the presidency and the Supreme Court, but there have been more since then. Uh, I'm sure the Biden administration will run up against opposition in the Supreme Court as well. It seems like that's definitely already happening. Uh, and we'll see how his, his solicitor general, uh, who's kind of his advocate uh, to the Supreme Court, will, will affect that. Well, thanks for watching.